This is Mike Baker here. I always thought Romans was one of the greatest revelations. It's the first book the Holy Spirit actually told me to read. I've always had a relationship with him, God Almighty, the Holy Spirit. Uh, always. I don't remember not. I don't remember doubting that this is real and and saying, oh, I, I think this has just been a dream or listening to Satan's BS. But the Holy Spirit has led me along the way because I believe what the Word said. I had an introduction to the devil first thing. And I think this may sound stupid to some and irreligious to others, and sacrilegious too. I think you need a good dose of hell. A Christian, as soon as they get saved, a good dose of what they missed, what they're going into. I do. That it's never going away. Jesus, the revelation of Jesus is going to be for the rest of your life and forever. He's unfolding. He's a tremendous man. Tremendous God. But I was introduced to the demons and devils and fallen angels down here my, the first day I got saved. So there was an ongoing battle, and it was very, it was made very distinct and very clear to me. It may not have happened to any of you or a few of you or whatever, but it happened to me. It's my life. I had to deal with it, but I also had to share it. I was told to, or I wouldn't have. I wouldn't hardly share anything with anybody about any of this. But Romans was a, a wonderful book. Romans chapter 2. This always got me. In Romans chapter 1, which I already read, but Romans chapter 2, and I've, I've gone over it several times, and I've taught on it a few times and, and uh, spell it out for people. But Romans chapter 2, let me pray. Father, open the minds of those who are listening that don't get scrambled by your word. Your word is wonderful. I, I don't do it justice. I'm pretty bad with, with things like this. So please clean it up for me. Please, Lord Jesus. Anoint me, anoint everybody listening, and bring people to it. They need to hear it. Romans 1 was telling, it was it was pretty basic. It was the basic sinner. He was, he was, he was the nasty sinner. Now this one, Romans chapter 2, is the intellectual sinner. He's showing everybody sin. But, that, but 2 is going to go to the intellectual sinner. It's mostly talking about the Jew at the time. They were judging and making value judgments and so forth. And I've heard people say, don't judge me. Well, you're supposed to make value judgments of what you're going to be with and who you're going to be with and what you're going to do. You can judge those things. And God does raise up people to judge other people. That's important. But put things in its right context. And a lot of people don't. But Paul's talking about those who do the same thing that others do, but they stand in judgment over the top of it. And he's showing... It's not, it's not going to be good. Chapter 2 starts out like this. Therefore, you have no excuse or defense or justification, old man, whoever you are who judge and condemn others and other, for imposing as judge and passing sentence, posing as judge, and passing sentence on another, you condemn yourself because you who judge are habitually practicing the very same things that you censor and denounce. We're not talking about this happened one time or whatever. We're talking about somebody who continuously, constantly lives by that lifestyle of bad and judging others for doing the same thing they're doing. Verse 2, but if we know that the judgment and the adverse verdict and sentence of God falls justly in accordance with truth upon those who practice such things. And do you think or imagine, old man, when you judge and condemn those who practice such things and yet do them yourselves that you will escape God's judgment and elude his sentence and adverse verdict? I don't think so. Or are you so blind as to trifle with and presume upon and despise and underestimate the wealth of his kindness and forbearance and long-suffering patience? Oh, I've had people say this. God's been good to me. Everything's been fine. And they've been sinning all along for 30 years in every business and sex life and marriage and you name it. They're just little things and everybody does it. Nobody can go without sin. That's what they say. 
and and it's all been good. And then all of a sudden, the Lord comes down on them, and they're going behind the woodshed, and God starts whipping on them one thing at a time. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. Start doing this. And they have pains, and they have things that happen to them, and, and it's not going away. By Jesus Christ, I'm healed. It's not going away, and they're wondering why they're they're beating up the devil. We're going to whip the devil all up. And I've talked to him many times and said, that's not the devil, that's God. God doesn't do that sort of thing. Oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. In Hebrews, all through the word of God, you have to deal with him. Why do you think Jesus came here? Jesus came to the earth. Jesus, he, he, he made it, God made a body for himself and got inside of it and paid the price for you. Because you're, it's God you're going to have to deal with, not the devil. It's God you're going to have to deal with at the end of time, not the devil. His judgment is here all the time, and you're going to have to deal with God. God is saving you from himself. He's so wonderful. He is that nature. He's sin and, and him don't mix. It never did. Are you mindful or actually ignorant? Are you, are, are you un, un, unmindful? Are you unmindful and actually ignorant of the fact that God's kindness is intended to lead you, to lead you to repentance. It's not supposed to just say you're okay and take sin into the church and sin into the world and say, I'm a Christian, and it's okay to be sinful, and it's okay to be unholy, and it's okay to be unrighteous. Look at 1 Corinthians. It's not okay. They were the most fleshly, worldly church and did spiritual gifts. And, and Paul never said, all the gifts of the Spirit that you're doing are from the devil. They're of the devil. I've had some more Christians say that about miracles. That was the devil who did that. There are anti-tongues, anti-Pentecostal, anti-miracles, anti-everything. We're word people from beginning to end. I hear that all the time. Well, if you are word people, and you are very intelligent, I've read many, many, many good stuff, good stuff. Why aren't you praying in tongues? I, I'd go into penitentiaries, and I have before, and I'd help, help and minister to people. They're not all praying in tongues. If the tongues is of the devil, well, they should be praying in tongues. What's well, God's kindness is extended to lead you to repentance. That's what it's for. To change your mind. God not, not hardness, his kindness. The world's about to go through a change right now where it's just going to be the most ugly thing in the world. It's D-Day today. The 80th anniversary of D-Day. So many people are worried that's about to happen again. Most, a lot of people cry out to Jesus during those rough times. Not the good times. The good times is just... Go, go ahead and sin, repent, sin, repent, whatever you're going to do. Sin, don't repent. And God doesn't do anything for about five years, and all of a sudden it happens, or 10 years, or 20 years. You cuss like a sailor, and all of a sudden one day he comes to you and says, I don't like that. What? What? Is this the devil? No, it's me, Jesus. I don't like you swearing and cussing. Stop doing that. I don't like you committing adultery. Stop doing that. I don't like you doing so many different things, stealing. I don't like that. And all of a sudden you have to why didn't you tell me 15 years ago? I did. It's in my word. I wrote it. You won't know me without the word. You won't know who I am without the word. I'm in the word. I am the word. It's to change your mind and your inner man to accept God's will. Accept that's his will. Now, but by your, your callous and stubbornness, impotence of heart, you're storing up wrath and indignation for yourself on the day of wrath and indignation. Storing it up. There you go. You don't want to do that. Get rid of it. You and Jesus better talk. When God's righteous judgment, just doom, will be revealed. He doesn't want to do it. but he's, And he's made a way for you to get out of all of it if you just will. His son did it all. I don't know how or don't know why. I don't know all the workings and, <laughs> and things that happen in heaven. The legislature way before I was ever born, way, centuries before, before the world was ever created, he did this thing. I don't know why. This is the feller that makes dogs cast dirt, trees, flowers, beautiful things, the universe and its, its splendors. If physics, which we can't hardly figure, we open one door and we have 55,000 other questions. What's well, a black hole? Why are the stars doing this? Is the universe really expanding faster than the speed of light? I think we saw angels, but I'm not sure this is an outer space. We, what, is, what is all this stuff? He's slowly revealing himself more and more, especially the last hundred years or so. It's, it's been pretty, pretty radical. Verse 6 says, For he will render to every man, every man according to his works. You're not going to get out. Whoever you are listening to this, you're not getting out of this. You're an every man, every woman, same thing. For he will render to every man according to his works, justly, 
as his deeds deserve. Now there we go there too. They're not getting to heaven without Jesus. But you got a role to play when you're down here. Everything you're doing. To those who, by patient persistence in well-doing, springing from piety, seeking unseen but for sure glory and honor, long-term dividends. They they store them up. They know inside. So we got to do this. No matter no matter what. There are things that you do with yourself and with people. Kindness. Treat others like you want to be treated. So forth and so on, Jesus. It's it's common sense to you. You don't do them, you're in trouble. The eternal blessedness of immortality. Immortality. Immortal. You're going to live forever. You're not going to. Those of you, those of you, I have talked to people who have evangelized for nothing. Said, well, you're going to be as dead as a dog. You're not going to live anymore. Why? The Bible's a, a, a myth, mythological book. Oh, it's okay, but it's still a myth and made up. But, but, but men wrote it. I said, if I believe that, and I really thought that, then there is no reason for me to have any kind of moral system towards you. And I'm going to steal everything you got and probably shoot you in the end. I'll be a gangster deluxe until I get killed. I'll do what I want, take what I want, and, and, and there's nothing you can do about it because I'm going to die in the end anyway. It won't exist. I come out of slime, jumped out of trees, what, whatever it is. That's all a bunch of junk I made up. I said, why are you preaching this stuff? How are you helping anybody by telling everybody the Bible's not real? What are you doing that there's not going to be any judgment for you? Well, what are you doing? You're, you're creating little monsters. They're going to come back on you? There is a morality. There is an understanding. Jesus is Lord. He rose from the dead for you. These are all wonderful things. Wonderful things. These are justification things. Sanctification is working it out. That's what this we're talking about. Seeing the unseen but sure glory and honor of the eternal blessedness of immortality. He'll give eternal life to you. That's what he's doing. But... For those who are self-seeking, self-willed, and disobedient to the truth, which we talked about, but respond and responsive to wickedness, they respond to it easily, there will be indignation and wrath um, a lot. You know, sometimes we wonder it should hit earlier. We've watched people just go for years, just years spewing out nasty and hurting people all the time, making millions and destroying countries even because they're just full of the devil. And there will be tribulation and anguish and calamity and constraint for every soul of man who habitually does evil. Now that could be in a day or that could be a lifetime. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now remember Paul was talking to the Hebrews, the Jews. But glory and honor and heart peace shall be awarded to everyone who habitually does good. Habitually. Makes it their habit in life, not just once or twice. I think I've done good. I've done better, more better than I did worse. Now, God loves me. He'll get, Jesus gets you in. Jesus opens the door. Jesus paid the price for your salvation. That's it. But the rest of this is, I live by faith in the Son of God. And well, you do. Well, I'll show you my faith by my works. Now, after he entered in, you have a little common sense here. and You go a little further. The Jews first and also the Greeks. For God shows no partiality, undue favor, or unfairness. With him, one man is no different than another. Well, that's a fact. Although he has his favorites, don't tell me he don't. But as far as the judicial aspect of salvation, no, I don't think he has any favorites here. You're, you're, you're better. You're Jewish, so you get in automatically. I have known so many Jewish people in my time, and they aren't Jews. You are more Jew than they are. You Christians who are doing this, you're more, more Jewish than they are. They don't go to synagogue but once a year, maybe twice a year, and act like, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew. Jew. Oh, okay, your heritage is Jewish. Do you have some favor with God according to that? According to the covenants that he made with Abraham and the forefathers, yes, there will be a remnant to be saved continuously out of that into Christ Jesus. But nobody gets into heaven without Jesus. All who have sinned without the law will also perish without regards to the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged and condemned by the law. For it's not merely hearing the law, the Jewish law. Read that makes one righteous before God, but 
it is the doers of the law who will be held guiltless and acquitted and justified. The law was in order to lead to Christ. Christ came at the right time according to what the law said was going to happen. And the word said what was going to happen. He's going to show up, and he did. But they weren't looking for that type of Messiah. They were looking for what the rabbis taught. They were looking for a Messiah that was going to sit on a big white steed with his armor all polished and going to whip everybody at that point. Well, he fulfilled everything except that. Raise you from the dead. Feed the 5,000. But if he will put him in charge, it doesn't matter if we get killed. We'll get raised back up. And as far as feeding people, he could take a loaf of, <laughs> a loaf of bread and a couple of fish and just feed everybody. No problem. But he was a suffering Messiah. When they put him on trial, and I think Judas Iscariot, he, he pushed the deal. I think he turned him in just to make to see if he's, you, you have to stand up now. You have to be that shining Messiah now. You've got to do this now. I think when he did that and he realized he's not that type of Messiah. I have, I have condemned an innocent man. He threw the silver down at their feet and ran out and hung himself. He was repentant, but not repentant sorrow that, that Peter was. It was a type of different repentance. There's people in prison right now to this day that are very sorry. They're sorry they got caught. They're not going to change their mind. That type of repentance, you have to put everything involved in it. Emotions, feelings, uh, power, strength, everything, spirit, soul, everything. Your mind goes into changing your life because the power of the Holy Spirit will be there to help push it through. But you have to do it. It's free will. You have to make those decisions. You sit there and teeter back and forth and between the flesh and the devil and, and God and devil, flesh and God, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You have to make a decision. And you don't make a decision tomorrow, right now. When Gentiles who have not the divine law do instinctly what the law requires, out of their hearts, they are a law to themselves since they do not have the law. Now, I've seen people live like that, and they get the gospel, and they do everything in them. They try not to sin. They were raised that way, no sinning. All of a sudden, they sin. They knew that they had messed it up. They knew it's, it's messed up now. They need Christ. He's going to make sure that you need Jesus, that you understand you have to have Jesus to get here. That Adamic nature that, that came down from Adam through the bloodline was the gift that Adam gave you was death. What Christ gave you was life. You have to choose him. It's very simple. You make choices of him. But he's not. this is not a computer program. You don't just push buttons and get in. No, there is a, a spirit there. I have ministered and preached and, and told people, you come to Jesus, I don't care if you raise your hand or don't raise your hand, stand up and run, whatever, and make a commitment. But it's the Holy Spirit. And I told them, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, if you hear a voice inside that says, this is it, come on, then you get, you get, get up and make a confession of it. They get healed and get delivered and come on through. You've entered into the kingdom of God. You were born again. Well, the Gentiles too. If that law doesn't instinctively what the law requires, they do that just instinctively. They are a law to themselves. If they never hear Christ, since they do not have the law. People are always wondering, well, can you get into heaven you know, without knowing Jesus? I, I don't know. I'm not God. I know that that our commission is to go preach the word everywhere, whether they like it or not. And many, and many times, I've gone into houses and we don't talk about religion, and then we don't talk about politics. The two very things that you should talk about since they're going to guide your life and death forever. The devil has got in there and just, this is what you do. No, you don't. Well, this starts so many fights. Of course it does. It's going to. It's life and death. Don't ever think the devil's not down here in his cohorts. Fallen angels everywhere of all sorts and sizes, demon spirits, disembodied spirits. I don't, a lot, I've seen a lot. I don't want to know anymore. Not about that. I want to know about the kingdom of God. Now, they show that the essential requirements of the law are written in their hearts and are operating there. You've seen people who have that operating in, and you've seen people who have the darkness operating in anything they're going to do, Anything you can do, dark, they do it. With which their conscience, their sense of right and wrong, also bears witness to their moral decisions, their arguments of reason, their condemning or approving thoughts, will accuse them or perhaps defend and excuse them. My own opinion is this, unless you're born again and you have a renewed mind, your conscience is not a good guide. It's not a good guide. There's too many things in the, the world pulling on it. Will it excuse them on, on the day that when my gospel proclaimed God by Jesus Christ will judge men? 
in regard to the things which they conceal their hidden thoughts. He'll reveal them. Now, you guys remember this. This is everybody's listening to me. Remember, your hidden thoughts are going to be revealed, so you better expose them to Jesus right now. Don't hide nothing from him because you're not going to. And I don't know about the exposing part. If you're just him and you and the world, you'll be there looking. looking. There's probably a lot of things you don't want to expose, so you better expose them to Jesus. Get them under the blood of the Lamb. Are you supposed to repent? Repentance won't. Uh, that type of repentance. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That won't get you saved. What gets you? Like I told you, you <laughs> there are prisons full of <laughs> I'm so sorry I got caught. But that repentance leads you to salvation, which it can. Thinking, thinking leads you to salvation. If you hear the Holy Spirit today, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation where your fathers tested me, where your fathers pushed me, tested me. A lot of them died, and for 40 years they marched around, and about 10,000 funerals a day for quite a while. A lot of tears on the pillows at night. Shoes never wore out. You couldn't go to the store, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. The excitement that you had in life was over because you didn't believe God. Well, but if you bear the name of Jew and rely upon the law and pride yourself in God and your relationship to him, and know and understand his will, and discerning approval, the better things, of course, and have a, a sense of what is vital, because you are instructed by the law. And if you are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness, because you know the way, Jesus said that over in Jerusalem, the Jews have the truth. He's telling the woman at the well. Well, they did. They had the law. But then they stopped right there. You are a corrector of the foolish. You're a teacher, are you? A teacher of the childish? Having in the law an embodiment of knowledge and the truth? Well, that's yes. Well, then, you who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you teach against stealing, do you steal? Take what does not really belong to you at all? You who say not to commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Are you unchaste in action or in thought? You thought life is very important, by the way. I don't know what can hear you or see you or out there. I don't know in that other dimension or where, whatever's out there. Whatever Jesus is in another dimension, sitting on the throne of God. He's not here. We can't see him. He hasn't manifested himself here, and I don't think he's done that for a long time. I think the Holy Spirit, which looks like Jesus and God the Father, he's here. You who abhor and loathe idols, do you rob temples? Do you appropriate to your own use what is consecrated to God? Do you rob temples? Are you still in the church? Are you taking money in the church that you shouldn't take? Are you doing things and taking things from the church out of the church that God's temple, God's place is church is right now? Do you appropriate to your own use what is consecrated to God, thus robbing the sanctuary and doing Sacrilege? Do you? A lot of people are getting caught right now. <laughs> a lot of ministers are doing things they shouldn't have done one way or the other. You who say not to commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Are you unchaste? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law, by stealthily infringing upon or carelessly neglecting or openly breaking it? God's written law or unwritten law. And this is the Jew anyway. For as it's written, the name of God is maligned, blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Hypocrites. They don't want. And I know Christians right now. There's lots of them tell me I, I don't want to go to church anymore because I can get beat up down the bar just as easy. And usually they don't. It's hard to live with Christians. They're kind of rough, self sanctified, self. <laughs> there's all kinds of unrighteousness. And they pick on the, the ones who just come in. You're not supposed to do this, you're not supposed to do that. I've, I've watched over a period of time. I had a church for years, a little little church, and a wonderful little Bible study. It's the most powerful thing in the world. You don't mess with God. But I have people that were shacked up and coming to the Bible study. I wasn't supposed to talk to them yet. But most of them got away with about about three months to four months. That's it. You can't come anymore. We talked to them. Because you're, you're, you're sinning. And you're making it okay. I'm, I'm telling everybody this. It's, it's not right to do this, but, but I'm letting you come here, and it's saying it's okay. But it's not okay. We're all this judgment is about to hit us all from you. So please don't come back here. 
Oh, they go out and get married. I told them before, you're not supposed to even be getting married. You don't have anything in common. You're not sanctified in that way. You may be justified by being born again, both of you are. And I'm not going to say you weren't born again because you were born again. But I'm not supposed to be careless. And I don't want the rest of the world saying, uh, well, it's, it's okay to do this. And then the, the Holy One, the ones that really walk with God, said, you know, horrible things. And I don't want other people blaspheming Jesus' name and blaspheming God's name. Uh, well, the Gentiles, so to speak, because of you. The words to this effect are from your own scriptures. Circumcision doesn't indeed profit. It, it, it does indeed profit if you keep the law. That's what it's there for. But if you habitually transgress the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcised. You don't have a circumcised heart. If, you have, if you're born again, there's a, a circumcision of the heart, so to speak. But you don't keep what has been given to you. What, what good is it? It's just going to blaspheme everybody else. It's not work. So they blaspheme God. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be credited to him as equivalent to circumcision? I have met so many people. I, I know a lot of Gentiles, even once like, in cults. Lots of them, lots of different cults. But I mean, they're righteous. They're pretty holy to the end. They're righteous. They look more Christian than Christians. That's for sure. Christians are well. The blood of Jesus covers my sins, so they're sinful. They're just sinful people and washed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb every week, which they're supposed to be. But you're not supposed to go out and sin every day. Sin, 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 sin. This is intellectual sinning. You can sin by, by, by doing 30 years you spent on a certain project as an engineer or a, a, a sophisticated a lab, a doctor. You're trying to find the cure for whatever. You're writing books that are just so fantastic about the human body and mind. And you've neglected the spiritual things that are there for you. But you, intellectually, you're just you're something else. You're a, a humninger. There have been men, men and women of God all over this world that have handled world affairs to such a great degree they are fantastic human beings if they ran over jesus they wouldn't know they hit him they have seared the conscience mind they unintentionally just didn't have time for it would they needed to make time for it. the holy spirit talked to them and they okay that's fine well they're going about their life that's a intellectual sinning or are they mentally assent to these things they're not really born again. they never had the experience you have to have the experience of the new birth your spirit needs to be regenerated. The old man has to be done away with. The Holy Spirit comes in and they start. he starts doing renovation work on the inside of you right away. Well, if you're not out there sinning and committing adultery and doing all those other things, but you're psychologically sinning, I don't, I don't steal, I don't this, I don't that, I don't that, I don't that. Well, psychologically, you might not be, but you're certainly not saved. I've gone into churches that were full of Christians, so to speak, they ministered there and knew inside there weren't very many people there that were saved. There were hundreds of people that were Christians on the outside. They've gone to church since they were five. They follow the law with their heart the best they can, whatever it is that they believe. And usually it's, it's, it's good things, it's not bad things. But they've never had an experience with Jesus. And you start asking them those things, they haven't had those things. They live by faith in the Word, but not by faith in Jesus and what He did in the Word for them. They haven't received those things yet. Now, some people, I've told them, you stay there and you call on the name of Jesus till he comes. What? You stay there in prayer and you call upon the name of Jesus till he shows up. And a lot of times the Holy Spirit shows up and says, what do you want? And they're sitting there with, they're dying. They have cancer, they have whatever. And he says, what do you want? And they'll go, well, it's kind of obvious. He goes, no, it isn't. Yes, you called by my name. So those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So forth, so on. And salvation means a deliverance from whatever. And I said, when he does that, when he asks you what you want, or he may show up and just do you, tell him, I need healed from cancer, and I believe I receive healing right now from what you did for me. I tell them that. They don't know anything else. I just tell them that. Some of them get it. Some of them are rough, and they just stay there till they get it. Some of them just give up quick. You know, they'll pray an hour. Say they're not even praying, just say the name of Jesus. Twenty eight. For he is not a real Jew who is only one outwardly and publicly, nor is 
true circumcision something external and physical. It's of the heart. You're not fakey. Not phony. Your allegiance is to Jesus from now on. Forever. You got saved by faith in the name of Jesus and him alone. All the other things you work out along the way. You walk by faith for the rest of your life in the promises of God and what Jesus wants to do to you at that time. It's not hit and miss, and I believe for a truck and a, a motorcycle and a car and, and an airplane and a billion dollars. Hey, man, he might, might be working some kind of morality inside of you. You have to be good to your brethren. I don't like my brethren. I don't care if you like them or not. Be good with them. Your mom and dad, when you were children, if there were more than one child in your family, would tell you, quit fighting. You're supposed to love each other. We What? But he gave this, he took this, well, give it to them, and they'll shut up. But I won't have, you'll get something back. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and true circumcision is of the heart. It's a spiritual and not a literal matter. His praise is not from men, but from God. I'm going to end right there. One and two, we're talking about different kinds of sinners, but they're all sinners. You'll find yourself in there somewhere. I find myself in there somewhere. I've been walking with the Lord 40 years. I need saved just as bad now, if not more, now than I did then. Jesus, and I've told people before, they've looked at me and said, well, I don't know about you. You're not quite a Christian. Like, And I said, like, you think I'm supposed to be a Christian? I said, Jesus came to save those who need us saved. I need us saved then. I need us saved now. It's not like I didn't walk in sanctification and do away with things that I'm supposed to do away with in the Lord. And don't do this. Don't do that. Because that lets the devil in your life, and he's trying to save me from him. Things that come into your life, and you're going, how did that happen? Because of this. I got mad and cussed at a guy. He took it back and so forth, but the devil came. Smoking cigarettes, it won't kill you, but you should, you'll receive the devil. He'll show up. You open the door for the devil to come in, and God can't kick him out because it's free will. You invited him in, so you get him back out. Getting angry at your brother. Gossiping. Oh, that's horrible. There's so many different things that you let the devil in your life. And I want to tell you, you'll have a horrible life here. The blessings of God will not come upon you too much after sanctification starts until you get rid of them. And he's telling you, he's showing you, get rid of these things out of your life. Why? Even if it hurts. Jesus... Jesus was made perfect, or matured, from the things he suffered. Did Jesus suffer? Yeah, it said he suffered. He had to walk in the Spirit, not the flesh. The flesh, the gratification of the flesh. You'll go to fast and eat 55 different meals of, from different cultures until you blow up and say, what, what happened? Your flesh doesn't like it. Your flesh is enmity against God, will always be enmity against God. The last breath that it breathes and screams will be, I hate you, Jesus. I hate you, God. You'll have to deal with him. There is no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walked out after the Spirit. It went on. That's right. Who, who don't walk after the Spirit, but walk after the, uh, don't walk after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit. Those who do the things of the Spirit apply the things of the Spirit. This is Mike. You have a great day.